Hi. Hi, good evening. My name is Ana Maria Leon. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate here at the HTC group, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker tonight. I first met Andres Hake in 2012 when I invited him to participate in Thresholds, which is our departmental journal, so I'm plugging it a little bit. Um, I was interested in the work of Andres Hake Architects and the Office for Political Innovation, which are the two sides of his practice, and perhaps we can discuss that later, as a new approach to the political in architecture. In Thresholds 41, Revolution, we published Escarabox, a wonderful project that transforms discarded agricultural infrastructure to, quote, grow crops of voice-equipped citizens, unquote. By inserting these agricultural remnants into the urban realm, the project brings to the foreground the links between economic crisis and citizen participation. Since then, Andres's work has become an important referent in contemporary architectural discourse. He's currently advanced design professor at GSAPP Colombia. He has been Tessano stipendiat in Hamburg and has lectured around the world, including Princeton, ETH Zurich, Instituto Politécnico de Milano, Centro Inter Internacional por la Ville de Paris, Sociedad Central de Arquitectos in Buenos Aires, and last spring here at MIT in the ACT department as part of the Public Space Symposium. His work has been presented at the Museum of Modern Art, the Lisbon Triennale, the Red Cat Gallery at Cal Art Center for Contemporary Arts, and twice at the Biennale di Venezia, where this summer he won the Silver Lion. His participation in the Biennale makes for an interesting thread in the context of uh, prior lectures this semester, which, I have included, which have included the curators to the Korean, United States, and Israel pavilions. And I hope he tells us a little bit more about his contribution, sales oddity. Uh, Andres Hake's work also intersects with another recent lecture we had recently at the CAST Symposium by a French philosopher and sociologist of science, Bruno Latour. So in fact, thinking with Latour, I want to propose Andres Hake's work as a critical practice. Latour has offered a wonderful definition of the critic, and I quote, the critic is not the one who debunks, but the one who assembles. The critic is not, is not the one, sorry, is not the one who lifts the rug from under the feet of naive believers, but the one who offers the participants arenas in which to gather. The critic is the one for whom, if something is constructed, that it means it is fragile and thus in need of great care and caution." Unquote. So Andres's architectural practice critically assembles bodies, objects, and processes, and brings them together to reveal them as instances of power negotiation in the built realm. His is necessarily a multidisciplinary practice, but beyond the range of media that he employs, and it's important to note his use of performance, film, everyday objects, etc. I want to call also attention to the seemingly disparate actors that he brings together to reveal them as sharing a common ground. For instance, the disobedient bodies resisting the domestic normativity of a popular furniture catalog are reframed as actors in a struggle against gender and class difference and revealed as the producers of complex networks of programmatic ingenuity that are integral components of our built environment. In another work, he brings together vacuums, chemicals, and building parts required to maintain the pristine appearance of a canonical building, revealing the constant labor required to maintain the illusion of uh, timelessness. By bringing together these buildings, users, objects, materials, tools, processes, events, into a common arena in which to gather, as Latour would say, Andres Hake reveals the complex interactions that constitute our social realm and manifest themselves in the built environment. Andres Hake's work maps how rules and regulations are resisted and subverted and reframes this resistance as a form of architectural practice in, what, in that it truly constructs the built environment that surrounds us. Architecture, like the title of his lecture tonight tells us, is understood as rendered society itself. Please join me in welcoming Andres yeah. Hake. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Ana Maria, for this wonderful presentation. And thank you very much for inviting me here, and thank you very much uh, to all of you for being here tonight. OK, I would like to start with this image, because uh, this is a diagram that we had to do a few years ago. And we put together everything that we had been working in the office for the last years. And when we started to see that, we, of course, we had been doing buildings all the time. Uh, but together with that, or let's say that they were part of many, many other things that were necessary to engage with certain societies. 
So let's say that in order for the buildings to become socially uh, attached, there were many, many other things that were collaborating and somehow were playing key roles that I would call architectural. This is the team that I'm working with, and that's Roberta that many of you have been in touch uh, with now. And uh, I'm going to talk about the collective production that we've been doing. And actually, this is only part of it, because in any production, there's many, many other things, many other people, many other institutions, technologies, and that's basically about what I'm talking. Uh, I'm going to uh, follow four principles, four uh, uh, ideas that are attracting interest and practices and many things around me. The first is how architecture can be understood as rendered society. This, anyone knows what this is? Okay, probably it's very unknown. Actually, it was the first photograph that was taken in this place, uh, as far as we know. And, but it's a vital architectural device, a momentous one, that is shaping the way we perceive modern architecture, all of us. It's the uh, basement of the reconstruction of the Barcelona Pavilion. And I was here because uh, uh, they run, the, the Mies van der Rohe Foundation runs a, a, a series of uh, invitations for different artists and architects to do interventions on the pavilion. So I wanted to start to work uh, in a very pragmatical way. So I was not that much interested on the mythology of the pavilion, but basically uh, I wanted to approach it from a very pragmatical perspective to see precisely how the daily architecture is produced in a place like this. And what was very interesting is that the first thing that we uh, uh, discovered this was there was this basement that was so much disregarded until that moment. And when we went to the basement, we found things like this. This is a piece of a broken glass coming from the cold, uh, cold yard, the one where the sculpture is. Uh, it's one of the tinted uh, glasses. What we did is to interview and have long conversations with everyone or with a, a broad number of people that had to do with the daily maintenance, the production, even the, the people that started to work with the reconstruction of the pavilion. For instance, this person is the one that is in charge of selling tickets and controlling the access to, uh, of visitors to the pavilion. Or for instance, uh, this woman is the gardener. This is the manager of the pavilion. And this is the architect in charge of its, its maintenance. This is the architect who before was in charge of the maintenance. And for instance, this is one of the architects, Fernando Ramos, who signed the project of its reconstruction in the 80s. This is another one, another architect, Christian Sirisi, who also signed that project and was in charge of developing it. And this is a person, a woman, that is, in, is part of the cleaning staff. Uh, Let's go to the basement. It's very interesting to see how solemnly are, how uh, uh, monumentally are organized all these broken pieces of travertine. Uh, if you think if, uh, what the, the effort that it uh, requires, the endeavor dedicated to really take these super heavy slabs of travertine to the basement, you see that there's something very weird. These things are not are broken. They're not able to perform the function they were supposed to be doing. Um, but they're not thrown away. Somehow they retain some of the value that they had when they were up there by the fact that they were part, some, uh, at some point they were part of the pavilion. And they're carefully taken down there to the basement with a, with a huge effort. It's very interesting to see that there are other things that are kept there in the, in the basement. Like for instance, this door. Uh, this door was one of the, it was the first one that was placed there. And it was the, the device in which a particular system to uh, connect the, the door to the floor and the, and the ceiling was tested. And it didn't work. The, the, the door was too heavy for it, and so it broke. And somehow, the remains of the experiment need to be uh, concealed down there in the basement. And that's where the door is. This is very interesting. This is a, a, fade, a fading red velvet curtain. Uh, of course, with the, with the sun, they start to do like this, they fade like this, and because there's a need to preserve the pavilion as uh, the instant image of what happened in 1929, and this kind of aging, it's, uh, it's not aligned with that story. When it starts to happen, they are taken down there. So basically, 
the pavilion needs to be always like this. And when it starts to do this, they're taking the curtains or whatever that is showing how impossible it is to have an instant frozen uh, architecture, um, then they take down there. In a way, the pavilion uh, with its basement has this kind of relationship of Dorian Gray with his uh, picture. And it's very interesting, oh, this one here. And it's very interesting to, for me to see what are the extensions of those Dorian Gray uh, realities that need to be uh, concealed in the, in the basement. This is very interesting for me. You see here that there's this plexiglass, this black plexiglass uh, panels. They were covering the, the lake, the black lake, the interior lake. And at some point, with the effect of the sun, they started to curve. And of course, the, the image that that produced was not that much related to the one that they thought that had to do with mist. And therefore, they were taken down there and replaced by glass panels. It's very interesting for me to see that because we see that the, it's not only that aging, it's something that is not welcome in the pavilion, but also experimentation. The pavilion is not produced, or at least it needs to be uh, conveyed as something that is not produced by tentative experimentation, but something that is produ produced at once. Of course, it's something that could not be clean, or it actually doesn't get dirt, uh, dirty, because for instance, the water, uh, it's got a huge system, not the original pavilion, but the one that was reconstructed has a huge system to filter it and to sort it like as a swimming pool, so it prevents from the water from getting green, basically. It's not fixed, apparently, or even very subtle things like the fact that in order to make economically feasible the pavilion, there's a need to rent it for events. But the remains, the equipment that is needed for that to happen, instantly after the event is finished, it's taken down to the basement. There's no trace of that anymore up there. Uh, it's very interesting to see that there are all, all sorts of conflicts like the fact, for instance, that the pillows are getting old all the time, so there's a huge storage of pillows coming from null. Or, for instance, that very ordinary activities that you could think that could be upstairs, but they're not there, like the office. The pavilion is not something that needs to be managed somehow. What is very interesting is that, of course, the basic things, ordinary activities, like in any place where people, where there are employees that need to have a place. They need to be accommodated somewhere. For instance, the employees need to have lunch, and they need, somehow they need to do the dishes. So mixed with the filtering system, they have the place where they do the dishes. And what is very interesting for me is to see what's going on here. Because somehow, the employees are not that different to Ms. van der Rohe. They're very much engaged on some sort of assemblies, Material assemblies, like the ones that Miss van der Rohe was doing before and after he built with Lili Reich the Miss van der Rohe pavilion. So these kind of collages that we can see here make us think that maybe many of the cultural uh, issues that are dealt here, many of the political constructions that we see here are not really so much disconnected with the upper floor. And somehow many of the traditions that uh, eliminated and made it possible the construction of this pavilion in the first place are remaining in the ordinary life that tends to be concealed and hidden down there in the basement. This is very interesting because if we want to see what is the very inhabitant, the proper, the specific inhabitant of the pavilion, maybe we have to find it in the one that lives here, uh, the cat Niebla. This one, this is the cat Niebla, and her body is totally constructed by the, tran the transience between the upper and the down floor uh, because she's blind now after years living in the dark. And it's very interesting to see that she's, it's, it's playing a key role because she's probably the one that uh, it's equipped to go from one floor to the other. See, every night she's taken upstairs, so they make sure that there's no rats or, or mice in, uh, in the pavilion and she's taken back to the basement. This is the basement, as it was constructed in the 80s, and there's something very interesting. What is the design that connects these two architecture is a, a momentous thing. Of course, it's a very particular and intended 
material device. That staircase. And what is interesting is that this awful, apparently awful design, is a very precise and very much intentional design. Uh, well, let's go to here. Uh, it's a staircase that is not fulfilling the requirements to be uh, uh, acceptable for humans, at least not within the current regulation. You can see it here. It's basically too tiny, the hole, so anyone could jeopardize his or her head by using it. And it was very interesting or really awful to know that the first director of the pavilion is here with some of the architects, with Ignacy Sola Morales, Rosa Subirat, had an awful accident when using the staircase to go to the basement and that kept her in bed for months. Mm, okay. What is very interesting is that this device, the staircase, was intended. When I was interviewing all these architects that took part and took the decisions during the reconstruction, they explicitly said that there was a huge discussion that took months on how to connect the two parts of the pavilion. And they ended up deciding that an awful staircase needs to be provided, and a staircase that somehow would never be accepted for visitors. And therefore, that would be the device that could prevent in the future that any new director could uh, uh, go and accept the temptation of using the basement as an exhibition space. In a way, the main concern of the architects was to keep the pavilion as an unexplained one, a piece of architecture that is never explained and it's directly uh, experienced as a pure and rational uh, uh, architectural perception. Let's go to some details. This is the first uh, commercial that was shot there in the pavilion. This is a more recent one, a presentation of a car. And this is a extract of one of the conversations I, uh, I had with the architect in charge of its maintenance. When an event is organized, such as a cold cocktail party or the shooting of a commercial, I make sure that the look of the place remains as far as possible the same you can see now, an empty space, let's say, with nothing in it. And what does that mean? It involves a host of functional difficulties, you know, but that original look is what I have to protect, preventing many things being placed here. When it comes to intervening upon the building, it's important to ask yourself what Ms. van der Rohe would have done. Don't you agree? This is another text that for me is very interesting. It's an extract from a, uh, an article that was published by Ignacio Solar Morales, Christian Sirisi, and Fernando Ramos, the three architects in charge of, its, of the pavilion's reconstruction, at the moment that they were starting the construction. And it was sort of the explanation that they were giving to the, to the discipline of what was that that they were doing. If we talk about idea and materialization, it is because from the study of the project documentation and other works by the architect from the same period, we learn that execution of the building, either for economical reason, lack of time, or simply due to a technological limitations, did not always imply realization of the idea that before, during, and after was proposed by Miss as characteristic of the building. This is very important for me. So we see that there's this distinction between the Miss idea and a series of circumstances that somehow are not attached to that idea. In a way, it's presenting the possibility that Miss idea was something previous to any circumstance, to any fact that uh, could be seen as mere accidents within the evolution and the development and the fully uh, construction of the idea. It's very inter interesting to see what are those pity circumstances, and they are the state of the art of technology, resources, time, huge things that basically are the ones that are constructing society every day, and those are not supposed to be part of Mies' idea. To this attack, uh, Mies' design, Mies' practices, Mies' existence, from those limitations, there's this idea that somehow the exceptional comes from the evacuation of the ordinary. That basically, architecture is about disconnecting with society. When we see these images, we see how that is deeply performed 
in a way, the, the architecture of the pavilion as a two-story building, it's been performed. The basement seems to be the device whereby the, whereby the traces and reminders of all the negotiations, experiments, accidents, discussions, evolutions, and compromises that define the pavilion's enduring existence through time, in nature, across different political contexts and changing economical schemes are hidden from visitors and effectively, effectively rendered invisible. But then the pavilion's basement is the place where the evidence is left behind by an important number of micro stories around the building's existence, preservation, and performance are black boxed. The pavilion's mis experience or mis, mis idea, as it is reproduced daily, seems not to be possible if all the negotiation, compromises, experiments, assemblies that outline the building's wider social footprint did not remain unaccountable beyond a scrutiny. Immersion in this experience, therefore, seems to require the sustained omission of all that makes it possible in the first place. This is another image. You see, per these images are taken from a very similar point of view, but in, of course, different stories. This is the pavilion that I'm interested on, the one that has these two realities that are performing how the pavilion renders the social. And we need to see that that's not something accidental. Transparency, it's been found in most of the architectural projects, social projects, political projects that uh, took uh, certain importance in Europe in the last years, in the last decades, in the last centuries. We have to remember, for instance, that the European Union, if we have to find what were the origins, are not the still the European coal and steel community, but really the European Broadcasting Union that was founded three years before that. And for instance, we have to see that in 2004, when there was this huge discussion to provide a treaty establishing a constitution to Europe, basically the only thing that everyone would agree is that transparency was a constituting technology that uh, was unifying Europe. When we see how that was already something that was part of the debates in which Mies was culturally and disciplinary accounted, we see that works like this were really interpreted not only as uh, devices that brought uh, material or visual constructions, but also in political terms. Georgi Kepets was explaining language and vision how transparency is required, and talking of works like this, is required when different figures demand a space of their own when inserted together in a common ground. We see now that that importance of transparency and really to play with the way that we produce common grounds in which things become visible and the diversity society is made of is constructed as something that could be broadcasted and therefore have a projective effect on the making of societies. It's something that keeps happening within the pavilion. And photographs like this in Flickr are circulating all the times, followed by other ones like these ones and like these ones. So basically, our intervention had to do with how to produce an ordinary account of the pavilion. A pavilion that doesn't really make this separation between the ordinary and the exceptional, and which basically finds that maybe uh, a different way of articulating those realities, it's possible. We took these things that we found in the basement and we placed them all around with the idea that by using this machine that is so effectively producing renderings of the social, we could also have an effect on how it was perceived and how it was constructed as a social reality. It is very interesting to see that all these objects are parts of big stories. For instance, the one that I like the best is the one of the water lilies. There is a cosmopolitical uh, construction that has a huge importance. Uh, at the time that uh, Christian Sirisi, Ignacio Sola Morales, and Fernando Ramos were reconstructing the pavilion, there was a huge uh, influence of many theories on the account of what the original pavilion was ab about. Basically, they, when they saw photographs like this, they saw uh, geometries, they saw modules, they saw materials, they saw constructive solutions, 
but they never saw the water lilies. In the conversations that I had with them, they, they said, at that time, we thought the water lilies were accidental. They were part of the decoration that was placed in the first, uh, the first moments to make it nice to a broader public, but it, we thought they had no architectural importance. Then, with the emergency of the architecture of landscape and the landscape architecture and all different trends that reclaim space in architecture for certain kinds of non-humans, like uh, plants, then experiments started to be carried out, oh, sorry, to bring back the water lilies. So new architectural devices were tested, like these, box, these glass boxes that was placed with, in the middle of the lake to make it possible that to have inside the boxes clean water without salt in which the water lilies could live. But they failed because the water lilies would grow and they would send their leaves to the salt water and then they would die. For me, what is very interesting is the fact that the pavilion is not constructed as an idea. It's not constructed as an idea that is independent from society, from its discussions, from its experiments, from its failures, from the way we change uh, our perception of things. But it's basically assembling a series of materials in a way that is always sus uh, sustained on change, discussion, arenas. Arenas in which architecture is providing the material devices that are regulating, in a certain part, those uh, compositions of different actors, of different uh, forces. Well, there's all sorts of stories behind all these things. For instance, the pavilion at some point, it's been described by many people. For even the, the German ambassador during the opening of the pavilion explained that it was a piece of Germany and a representative of the Weimar Republic. And it's been considered that the, the main room was uh, uh, a flag in itself, and it had the colors of the Weimar Republic. But let's say that the flag itself has been a big thing here, and it's been a changing and discussed reality. These are the flags. These are some of the flags that uh, have been disposed there, because, of course, the, um, the national constructions that have been entitled to put flags there uh, have been very diverse. And even now, it's, it's, it's very much discussed whether the, the, the Barcelona is going to be part of a, a Catalonian uh, uh, new nation or something like that. And it's a huge discussion that brings together the fact that even the tiny details like the flag uh, there, it's under discussion is, is, is also a, uh, a way of rendering the, 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 the political performance of the pavilion. These are some of the comments that were circulating at the time that we opened the uh, intervention. This is kind of a good one. This is uh, just accounting for its popularity. Uh, this is, actually I don't like that much this one, filled with junk. It was not really junk, but well. Uh, this one is it's more, uh, it had an insight of what's going on there. Um, yeah. And this is the one I, like, I love the best. For the first time, I'm glad Miss is dead. Uh, OK, now I'd like to talk about urban enactments, which is something that I'm intensively working on now. This is a campaign, uh, an advertisement campaign developed by the uh, Barcelona uh, advertisement company, SCPF, in 2007. But it's been tremendously influential all around the world because they created this idea that IKEA has been advertising all around, welcome to the independent republic of your home. For me, it's very interesting to see how that is meant different things in different contexts. Uh, here, it has to do with the fact that once you arrive home, you leave behind all these social conventions that make you so uncomfortable. And once you get here, it's totally different. It's got some political uh, institutional uh, meaning, like your house uh, is an independent republic, and it's uh, your kingdom. Of course, there's some confusion between kingdom and, and republic, but uh, it, it, it's not such a big deal. Uh, here again, kingdom and, OK. When we see here cases like this one, Candela is this lady here. She lives with her three daughters, her grandchildren, and six dogs in an old apartment in the Lavapiés district in Madrid. A number of elderly male neighbors living on their own regularly have dinner at Candela's place. Social networks based on solidarity flourish at such gatherings. This is one of the cases that we've been collecting and we have 
so many now. We have more than 200 now, but basically it's an archive of uh, people that in their domestic environment, they engage with the social. Basically, they go against this idea that IKEA is, re is reproducing and reproducing and making circulate that once at home you get disattached with society. Basically, when, look, when we look carefully, it's at home where probably we're developing the most effective political projects and where we construct our, the way we become citizens uh, by basic things like how we relate to others, how we relate to animals, whether we take, we're on the pill or not, whether we want to separate our garbage or not, whether we have uh, certain uses of energy or whether we decide to switch on TV at certain moments or switch it off. What we then it's did, it's kind of provide an adver a counter advertisement campaign that was called IKEA disobedience in which we were using the same tools that IKEA is performing all the time to provide a different version of the domestic. For instance, Berta, that here uh, uh, is Berta, but uh, he's, uh, she's Berta here, but now he's, uh, uh, he's Lucas. Uh, and, and at that time, she lived in a squad with a community of lesbian women, occupying the property afforded them an opportunity to develop a project based on principle of communal economy and self-management. Taking care of material needs is not the only issue they see as a common concern to be managed collectively. Contributing to the emotional and professional empowerment of each member of the community is also seen as everyone's responsibility. What for me was very interesting to see is that this project could never happen without that architecture. The architecture of this quote is very particular. It's divided in several stories. Uh, and in the ground floor, they have an open house in which they entertain all the neighbors. And what they do there is they play movies. And those movies are discussed by broad audiences that incorporate all the people of the neighborhood that are invited there and that engage, that therefore they engage on discussions that somehow have created a sensitivity to cases like that of Berta or Lucas and that uh, have transformed totally the accommodation of these people within their neighborhood. The architecture is not a neutral actor here. It's not a passive actor here, but it's really playing a key role in the making of this society. We could say something similar of this guy, Manolo, or Tony, or Aurora, or Daniel. And this was a project that was acquired by MoMA and was uh, the first uh, architectural performance that was part of its uh, collection. And that was kind of difficult for them to archive. And they asked us to reproduce the experience within New York City uh, so they could observe how it was performed and therefore their experts could see what that implied for the archives and what were the materials that they needed to collect it, basically. So we went to new cases and we found people that were really challenging knowledge from their homes or people that really didn't have a home and they were moving from one place to the other and that was uh, affecting intensively when you see how that scale up the, the design of the whole city. Or people like Muddy that uh, transformed the TV room of her place in Long Island City into a, her, to a saloon and she entertains all the people in the neighborhood there and it's in this suburb, this uh, TV room, it's become probably the closest thing that you could find to a public space because it's the, the place where people get to talk to each other, to meet the, uh, each other, to have the opportunity to get organized politically and to get assembled into something that is not just individuals uh, but it's uh, a richer uh, social structure. Or of course, Mama Gina, or this bunch of people. With that, we organized this kind of, I would call them trader first, or performances in which, in which they, we hacked uh, IKEA furniture to produce these uh, assemblies of these different activities. And that's the one we organized at PS1, for instance. You can see how these things became kind of a space of a social experimentation. Muddy here. Oh, it's not opening now. Well, I will open it here. Oh, we tied it up.
was reconstructed by TV urbanisms, and Milan was its epitome. It was to narrate to generic universal publics the value that industrial products had. A new urbanism was about to be born. Berlusconi's political well, this is the project that we presented and it's still now in the Luigi Venice Biennale. It's called Sales Oddity. It's very interesting for me because we discovered that uh, Berlusconi uh, is very well known because of his political activities, but also is very well known because of his media empire. But as many of you might know, uh, he started to work uh, and make his fortune uh, by doing urbanism. He founded this company uh, Edil Nord, and they started to promote gated cities, not exactly gated cities, but segregated cities, uh, of which the most important one is this one, Milano Due. What is very interesting for me is, when, is the story of Milano Due because it was meant to isolate something very particular, the number ones. The people that were consuming the most, and by is isolating them, uh, there was an opportunity to control how they spend their money and who was going to get the profit, basically, out of that money. To do that, there was something that was crucial: the development of a communal TV, a communal TV that started to be something accidentally produced, that but ended up being the media set comp uh, comp uh, 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 empire that now is shaping in a, to a, bit, a broad extent uh, the daily life of a big number of people uh, in Southern Europe. What is very interesting for me is to see how that was possible. When we see in detail how that happened and what was the participation Oh, we're back to the beginning. Let's go back to where we are. Here we are. Oh. Okay, sorry about this. Okay, this is Milano Due. What is very interesting for me is that architecture uh, has a, uh, played a key role in the making of all this reality. These buildings were designed so neighbors couldn't see each other. Basically, they uh, invested a, a huge amount of money. So basically, when you look through your windows, you would always see trees. Not only that, but the design of the paths was meant for people not to really have the opportunity to talk to each other that much. And basically, there were this idea that this place would collect all the number ones this sort of number ones here, the people that were working for the new uh, multinational companies, and would enable it uh, for them to relate to each other by means of the TV that was provided cabled uh, from the underground studios that were hidden underneath this lake, the Swans Lake. The Swans Lake was the center of the, of the or is still now the center of, the, of, the, of this city. And underneath it, they developed the studios of first Tele Milano that then evolved into Mediaset. When we see how that was constructed by, by means of media, we see that within time they developed a formula based on the fact that any house in Milano Due and after that all around Italy and then in other places like Spain or even France for a time, or the Netherlands, uh, it was mirrored the life that happened here in a TV schedule full of uh, shows that could reproduce every single thing that was happening here. So you could see people in the morning having breakfast, and when you went at night uh, to bed, you could see people in bed. 
The difference, of course, is that, is that all those fictional and mirror homes were installed or were accommod accommodating all these brands that were producing desire and the uh, idea that whatever you do at home needs to be associated with certain consumption patterns. Of course, we, need, we know all this because we're part of this now, all of us. But what is very interesting to see is that when you put it all together, we can see that basically the invention of Milano Due together with uh, Mediaset is the construction of multimedia urbanism. An urbanism in which what happens offline is related to things that happen online. And that homes have mirror homes that happen to be produced in underground studios uh, beneath the lake, the Swans Lake. All this reality keeps invisible for all of us. And the way uh, we as a discipline relate to this is basically to think that we can focus on designing a good balcony here most of the times. What is very interesting is that when we talk to the architects that uh, Ragazzi uh, and partners that work on designing this together with many other people, like Hofer, for instance, the landscape designer, and many other architects and designers, they were very conscious of what they were doing. They call it at that time, they wouldn't call it a multimedia or a transmedia uh, urbanism, but they would call it the polyedic urbanism at that time. And they uh, spend a lot of time developing things like magazines and newspapers for the neighborhood that then was the, were the origin, of course, of all this uh, construction. I would like to see this as an architectural plan, as a plan in which we see that architecture and urbanism is composed by many different technologies and many different uh, entities of very diverse um, uh, nature that come together in the way they are performed as a daily reality. I would like now to see another project, another architectural and urban project, this one, which is we start, started to study by looking at this house. This house is a, uh, an apartment, a tiny apartment uh, in the city center of Madrid. And it's occupied by something that uh, evolves, but more or less is like five or six people, five or six males, coming from originally from Senegal, from a place uh, where the uh, Murid brotherhoods are very much influential, uh, Tuba. Uh, they have transformed the house intensively, the apartment, and for instance, they, they transformed the closet so two people could live up there. That's the upper part of the closet, the place that was initially intended to be the, uh, where you could leave your suitcases. This is the reconstruction of the apartment that we did at a certain po point, but we saw that you could never explain what happens here by looking at this single architectural device. Because for instance, when it comes to narrate a very particular story, there are other actors that play key roles. For instance, this African restaurant in the same neighborhood, or this mosque, uh, which is located in an old uh, apartment in the same neighborhood, or basic things like cell phones, or phone parlors, that bring together all those other realities with that in Tuba, where the females, the elder, the children, the people with disabilities stay, while the males that are in a good age to make the best of their work travel to places like Madrid. This is another apartment. This is the reconstruction of this network. And for me, it's very interesting or very important to see that this is basically uh, the architecture that is behind the realities we live every day. Not that much the one that we tend to see in architectural magazines. When this guy will want at some point to go to, 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 to work to places like Madrid, Paris, or London, the grandma will make a phone call to someone in Madrid, a member of the family. This person will never take the phone, but will go to the phone parlor where the calls are cheaper. And then he will call back grandma, and grandma will tell him that at some point, this guy will arrive to Madrid. He will tell him that he needs to go to the African restaurant or supermarket, where he will find people that speak uh, his language, and also that will know how to find uh, the rest of the members of the brotherhood. And then he will be taken to one of these apartments, to these, or to these, or maybe to another one. 
when we see the performance of the urban, we see that this is the architecture that is constructing it. And it's an architecture that is based on the idea that heterogeneous entities could work together in the performance and that somehow they provide a base, a material base in which daily life is produced. Basically, with works like uh, the ANT tradition on the STS uh, traditions, uh, we're trying to move away from the idea of cities as the places where things happen and that are inevitably associated to ideas like uh, stable constructions in the land and to move from something that we could call urban enactments or enactments that are compositions of uh, heterogeneous entities that get together and are continuously transformed by the way they are performed. What is very interesting for me is that when we see these compositions, there's no way to say that architecture is neutral, that is not playing key roles here, but neither we could say that this, there's a techno-determinism, that only architecture is defined in the kind of society that is produced here. Basically, the way politics are embodied in these urban enactments is by sharing a ag agenda, sharing agency with all these uh, technologies and actors that get to produce uh, daily life as a material composition. No happy endings. This is something we're working on now, and actually I'm doing now a studio in Colombia on this particular building. The, of course, many of you will know it. Uh, it was actually in, in the paper in the Times a few days ago, and it's this tower that Har uh, Harry Marklow is developing in uh, New York, uh, in Park Avenue, it's uh, in 432 Park Avenue, and that is supposed to be the tallest tower in the Northern Hemisphere. And actually, to, to make it possible, he had to join forces with CIM Group, as you know, from Texas, and they hire a huge number of architects to work on that, so there's Rafael Vignoli doing part of it, Deborah Burke is doing another part, and what is most interesting for me, it's the work of Deepox. Are you familiar with the work of D-Box? Yeah, no one? Yeah, some people are familiar because of course we've seen all these videos that they're producing for normal for some partners, for many people. And I would like to carefully see uh, what's happening here. This is one of the renderings that they uh, advertised D-Box to present their company. And we see of course this sequence of things like this lady, then this guy here, then there's a conversation here. This seems to be kind of a romance scene or something like that. This is not accidental. This is the way it was, uh, uh, D-Box was described in the New Year magazine in the article, The Influential Architecture and Design. In the past few years, architecture has become the sexiest of arts. Keith Bommelie and his colleagues at D-Box are its pornographers. Actually, they became quite famous and notorious in the last days, in the last months, because they produced a four minutes movie to advertise or to convince potential buyers to buy apartments in the 432 Park Avenue Tower, uh, a very exclusive set of uh, potential buyers that are willing to pay or are able to pay $90 million for the penthouse or $22 million for a regular apartment in, uh, in the rest of the building. Uh, when we see how that movie was prepared and how carefully it was uh, designed, it's very interesting to see how much effort they played on selecting the model, Christina Makovsky, that was selected among 400 uh, female models that were audience and how they rented a professional movie uh, studio, Silver Cup Studios in Queens, to by means of, by using chroma, uh, create a very fictional story that happened to be ending in a cocktail party, this one, in one of the apartments in 432 Park Avenue. This is one of the, this is an image that it's also published in the magazine that they produced to sell the apartments. A magazine that probably none of you have seen because only billionaires probably have seen it. It's uh, a magazine that has been distributed, for instance, in the Hilton Carlton uh, in Moscow, together with a book on Dior. So an association between the, the 432 Park Avenue building and Dior, the fashion uh, firm, 
was directly connected for potential clients. I would like to see carefully what happens here. Of course, we see this marble that was selected by Deborah Burke. And, but what I'm interested in is the connection of this power of buying uh, privileged uh, access to these helicopter views, as they call them, to this. Actually, these people here were equally selected. There was a huge endeavor on selecting particularly this ugly guy here, as they would call him. Actually, they call him the Danny DeVito. They said, when we interviewed, we, we spent time interviewing the people of D-Box as part of the Columbia studio. And they said, at some point, we had all these beautiful people, but we needed a Danny DeVito guy. At some point, we thought that even uh, Marlowe could be the Danny DeVito, but he didn't want to be there. So we find this guy. He's not an actor. He's neither a model. He's an, an actual... He's a wealthy people, person that is very close to many of the people that took decisions here, and they convinced him to be there. The idea was to bring reality into the image, a reality with which the clients could identify themselves as part of the rendering. Somehow, this is the device that brings us, or well, those of you who are billionaires, could uh, uh, identify with this guy, that, this Danny DeVito guy. And that, of course, is not Danny DeVito. But what is interesting in how the scene is reconstructed that's an approach in with, uh, by which someone that could be similar to Danny DeVito is about to approach this uh, beautiful lady. Well, I really think that uh, in architectural renderings, there's always this idea that something like this is possible that the encounter of the difference could be peaceful and that could end up in some kind of happy ending. A way of saying that architecture is not about politics and that there's no need to really bring discussion, confrontation, a great effort to produce arenas in which the different needs to be uh, constructed uh, together, but really that it's something that could automatically happen without effort and that someone like Julia Roberts would be willing, as we know, it, she would never be willing to marry this awful and, and uh, boring guy. But that movies could somehow make it uh, be seen as uh, possible. OK, this is the origin of this project uh, that we developed uh, with Enrique Cray and Miguel de Guzman in Placencia, in a city in the west, southwestern part of, of Spain, as a result of an open competition that we won. The, it was basically, the, 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 the commission was basically to transform this 15th build, century building that had this 19th century uh, extension and provide a new extension that could somehow could double its uh, size and transform it all. So uh, the, the use that it had in the past that was a minor seminar could be uh, allocating a new one that was basically a, uh, an elder residency for old priests, Catholic priests. These photographs for me are very important. These are photographs of the minor seminar in the 50s. And while well, the previous one was a, a little bit too much, but this one is probably much more interesting. As you see here in the photograph, there's a number of kids that are trained uh, to do exercises all together, synchronized at the same time, but this guy, this instructor. So basically, their bodies become something similar to a body of reference, that probably of the athletic tradition. Um, when we see how that project of uh, making bodies and minds homogeneous was performed, we can see that architecture, again, was not playing a neutral role here but that the architecture of the house, uh, this, were, this was the original floor plan that we found there when we started to work on the building, was really helping that happen. Basically, they designed these dormitories so all these kids could be sleeping here, and during the night, a priest could go all around to watch their behaviors and somehow make sure that they were doing the right thing. Uh, what we did basically is transform the material device, the architecture, to promote, to provoke, to prompt another political uh, reaction within the or, or performance within the building. And these are photographs of the building. This is the new part. Uh, this is the old part and how it connects to a, a, also a new part. 
This is the connection between different buildings, the, the one that was new with the one of the 15th century, and in between them is the chapel. This is the, uh, the courtyard. This is the chapel that was designed like a, a self-service chapel because all the people living here could, or most of them, could perform mass. But what I'm interested on now is this. What we did is we distributed the number of toys, political toys, all around the building. Uh, devices that were meant to produce or to instigate political statements and decisions among the users. They were actually working like remote controls that I love. Uh, because basically when you're at home and, or in a place in, in, that you share with other people and you take the remote control, there's a debate that emerges. And I've been studying how that happens in living rooms, and it's very interesting how people discuss, and I remember many times how I discussed with other people because someone wanted to play a movie and the other wanted to put, uh, to, to put on the uh, soccer uh, match or whatever, and then I would uh, defend that we should see, I don't know, uh, girls uh, or Sex and the City or uh, what's the most interesting show now? I don't know, the Kardashian show. Okay. Uh, so we tried to, to do equal devices that somehow could prompt these reactions as a means to bring politics into daily life. This is the, and basically, for instance, these were the gardens. We distributed the gardens by, with, by using these numbers, and we entitled each person living here to use a piece of the garden to their own convenience uh, by assigning a number to each of them and to uh, sign in a part of the garden uh, as, uh, as the one that they could take decisions on. But we never defined the exact limits of the plots, and we never said what were, where were the paths that could lead to each part of the garden, so that was something that needed to be debated and discussed. This is a photograph we took a year after the, the, the place started to be lived. And this is very interesting because this guy is not really posing for the photograph, and he's neither uh, 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 really uh, being friendly to us. But basically, he was watching the garden because he was the person that convinced many of his neighbors to uh, allow him to uh, use the gardens. And he was having the gardens that the other ones were entitled to use. And he had a huge controversy with some people here that thought that the way he was putting onions and lettuce here was totally inappropriate for a garden so visible from the outside of the, of the clergy house. So there was this huge controversy going on that we could trace. What is very interesting is that even though here is the people that was participating in that controversy of flowers versus onions, and what we see is that we put them together to have a conversation with all of them and reconstruct the, the way that controversy have evolved. But it's very interesting is that when we took this photograph, we saw that maybe this is the rendering that is much more interesting. And maybe we could reclaim architecture to be producing these sort of renderings in which people are not necessarily uh, pretending to be all agreeing and being happy as in a happy ending but really to be represented or having an opportunity to inject and to insert and to participate in the making of the, the, the daily lives uh, by taking risky decisions that they had to discuss with others. And I would like to finish with a very particular architecture, the Escara box uh, that Ana Maria was mentioning and that we're now working on uh, extending them with adding new uh, designs to it uh, with a yeah, with the help of Matadero. This is the distribution of uh, contemporary art centers in Madrid. It's very interesting to see that most of them are located in what we could call probably the most expensive area in terms of real estate. Uh, we were tracing some of the most important places where creativity is developed now. And we saw that there was no coincidence between the geographic distribution of uh, independent spaces of creativity and those official ones that were really uh, accumulating and accommodating most part of the cultural investments in the city of Madrid. 
This is Matadero, which is the, the old slaughterhouse in Madrid that, of course, it lost its function as it happened to main, to most of the uh, uh, slaughterhouses all around the world when many technologies uh, changed and also the, uh, when, the, when the slaughter uh, activities were not that, that longer public and coordinated by a public agency. Uh, but they started to be privately managed and therefore they were distributed in different parts of the, of the, of the country. But basically, this was transformed slowly into a, um, a laboratory for architecture. And many architects were called to do things here. Actually, uh, Anton, uh, uh, an assembler uh, studio, worked on uh, one of the projects here, the Casa del Lector, and, uh, an institution that uh, was open slightly before, I believe, that the Scarabox were, were st started to be used. Uh, but basically, in between these buildings, uh, there were huge spaces that were never designed for humans. There were spaces that were really the places where the trucks could up and unload and, and load and be loaded with meat or with animals. And at the time that these buildings started to be used for humans, there was this need to provide shade here. Because basically in August here, there's no way to go to he from here to here without really dying in the sun. But the problem is that the activities that they uh, program here, the institutions that are part of this compound, are really very diverse. So at some time they might have a huge concert that needs all that space empty, and at some times they need to fragment it. And sometimes they need it uh, somehow organized as a square here, but other times they need it to be uh, kind of a circuit for bicycles to go all around. So we were called to propose something to, to provide shade here, and we proposed to uh, develop these devices, mobile devices, by reusing uh, uh, agricultural irrigating technologies that were so inexpensively available for two reasons. Basically because agriculture was not so much developed at that time in Spain because many of the traditional crops were removed, like for instance tabac, because of changes in the regulation of the European Union. And therefore the companies that were producing them and even the ones that were produced were very, very inexpensively available. We decided to customize them and to make them devices that could provide shade and that could move all around the squares. So basically they would provide shade without compromising the adaptability of the space. We ended up doing two of them. The Scarabox looks and we propose to do something else because we were providing shade and even though no one wanted any other thing than that, we propose to equip them with some basic uh, speakers, video uh, screens, uh, devices, so they somehow they could be used not only as say devices, but also as places where people could meet and where people that were never would never be invited to do something in a place like Matadero could gain the opportunity to self-organize events here in the same way that you could rent a tennis court uh, from the municipality to play for an hour, you could have come here and use these devices to organize a concert with your friends, or a lecture, or a meeting, or whatever, or to show the photographs of your holidays. Of course, it was not enough with doing these devices. We had to design a huge number of furniture, uh, mov uh, movable furniture that somehow could help people organizing all these things and that could adapt to many different situations. This is the other one. And again, it was equipped with things that enable people to do things like this. These were the technologies that we were using. And by putting together things that were really very ordinary technologies that are massively produced for other means, we ended up producing these devices by uh, putting together only 50,000 euros for each of them. It was much cheaper than the floor, the paving that is underneath them uh, in the same surface, I mean. This is the assembly, this is the furniture. When we see it together, they start to look a little bit like those constellations that I was telling you about, of the Moritz, of the Milano Due, of the um, uh, IKEA, the constructions that we saw. And basically we saw that at some point it started to be completed with many other things. 
This is a blog that was produced by a group that is called uh, Haha Collective and that was bringing together many other people and there were a team of curators that were being part of, the, of a series of performances that uh, taught people or showed people all the possibilities, the technical possibilities that these devices compromised and included. And for me, it's very interesting that when you put this together with the previous image, you see how this const initial constellation started to expand into networks of people, networks of websites, uh, curators, practices, all these things together that we start to see here. And that basically, see, here we see only a tiny part of them. But that somehow, I think, could be an approach in which design could start to reclaim some space in the making of those urban enactments that I was explaining before. These are photographs of the devices not used. And this is when they start to be used. It's very interesting to see that these devices have been used already for three years now. And that there's an average of, when, they, when they're underused, there's an average uh, public of 500 people, which is really uh, amazing for uh, a place like this. This is, for instance, some of the different situations. You see how different configurations are enabled by the uh, transformation also of the relationship between the different devices and the people that come here. For instance, this is the presentation of a uh, collection of fan signs that some people organized, and they, they invited many people to present their publications. This is another one. This is a fan thing. This is a very interesting mixture of people. You see that the... Uh, elder people from the neighborhood could come here, but also you could see like super trendy people come, coming probably from all areas in the city. Uh, people with kids, because, because it's so open, they can bring their kids and they might be cycling all around while the parents are having beers here. This is very particular so. Thank you very much. We will now be taking questions from the audience. Hi. Um, I enjoy your presentation. Thank you for that. And uh, I will talk about urban enactments where you show uh, that the physical space is not about just uh, spaces of places, but it's also spaces of flows and how those cyber and physical environments come together. And uh, But I feel, uh, and you talk about how, as a narrative, and you show that, but when, when I think about this kind of critical making, like uh, the in terms of cyberspace, the tech uh, activists does their job. They... Um, they uh, design software that uh, follows their uh, social justice and practical needs and then they contribute to the democratization of the mm -hmm. internet. But when it comes to architects, it's really hard that we never leave our um, like ethical, moral, white hat uh, mm -hmm. hacker ethos, but we almost never wear the illegal cracker ethos, not, yeah. uh, not never almost. Uh, but when it comes to critical making, uh, w some blending of those ethos as are necessary, and we have n almost no uh, education of this in the school, like not in here, but in just like architecture education. And I, if and this is the mm, century that we are living in, and these uh, spaces are so in communication, so I think we should to introduce this kind of critical making in the education system, so how would you introduce that? Like, um, one version of doing that, okay, just stop designing new things, but just try to uh, find these spaces of maneuvers as you did, and how you design those things, and I understand that new things has to be designed too, but I have a hard time to um, kind of find a, a medium to further be part of the critical making. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question because we're, uh, there's a number of uh, contexts in which uh, the politics are being um, developed as, um, let's say, response to very much domaining technologies or ways of dealing with technology. So the response many times comes uh, 
by means of hackering those technologies and finding opportunities to introduce uh, subversive uh, alternatives within them or by developing alternative spaces. Uh, what is very important for me is that, as you said, it's not easy from architectural practices, so it's not been so common to engage on those practices, even though there's a huge tradition of that as well. But, uh, but we, I, I would say that it's true what you're saying. It, it's, uh, there's a number of people that are working on that, developing also strategies from our discipline or giving importance to part of it that have to do with how to um, develop um, disobedience from design. But my interest is not that much that, because uh, when you see in detail many of the, let's say, breaking rules, uh, uh, practices that are very effective, for instance, in cyberspace, you see that in architecture, uh, the space in which things are uh, being produced is very much unregulated. So basically, for instance, people like uh, Harry Marlowe and these towers are operating many times by uh, providing huge damage to cities and by, for instance, concentrating the benefits of the city producers uh, in a very limited part of the city. So uh, I think that on the one hand, regulation in architecture has a very different meaning than in other spaces like uh, cyberspace. Sometimes regulation is at some extent the only opportunity for uh, a broader society to be represented by its city. And I find it sometimes difficult to defend some kind of deregulation of the urban because most of the times I've seen that the outcome of that is more or less uh, that basically the more powerful actors within an urban context are the ones that somehow gain possibilities of taking further their projections. What I'm interested on is micro rearticulations. How by design, and that's something that we can very easily achieve by, uh, with design. Basically intervene existing situations and do tiny uh, or slow uh, rearticulations of how power is developed there. When you see, for instance, the, the uh, case of the Murid Brotherhood, I found it very interesting the fact that they were really not confronting directly any reality. But they were reorganizing their space in a way that they could counteract for many of the impositions that they were receiving. I'm not saying that that's an ideal society, and I don't think that the architecture is the best one that they could get in terms of social construction. But what I see is that they develop a number of tactic rearticulations of their uh, techno society in a way that they ended up being slightly empowered. I think that this kind of rearticulation that has very much to do with the tradition of cosmopolitics rather than uh, foundational politics is the one that I think that uh, more easily are, uh, in which our discipline could more easily gain a, a broader uh, political uh, uh, agency. But I agree with you. It's, uh, it's a very hot issue. And I think that probably in the next years we'll see a number of experiments that probably will help us understand how to deal with these things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for a great uh, talk. Uh, I have two questions, and it's just actually expanding on, on, on these ideas about how to reconfigure uh, or, or through design uh, reuse uh, part participation in public spaces. One is just thinking uh, about architecture and its relation with global practices. So how would you expand the experimentation that you've been doing in a context of developed societies to uh, uh, undeveloped uh, areas, which are still the majority of of, of, uh, of the globe, where actually conflict is at stake. I was I was actually, you know, imagining this uh, 
this great game that you say like well people to get uh you know, really mad about cultivating carrots or flowers mm -hmm. in Spain, but I was wondering, you know, I was wondering how would that perform in a context like Brazil when actually just conflicts about the land are actually quite uh, at the core of, of, yeah. of institutional politics. And I think the, the other day, the, the other thing that I would uh, like to get your opinion in is about the relationship uh, between politics and everyday life. I think uh, there's a, I see a relationship with politics through subjective identity. Uh, and I was wondering if you were equally interested in like reactivating people's agency through the actual political system, which is actually, sadly or not sadly, how things are, are changed uh, in an everyday life uh, uh, setting. Yeah, yeah, the two questions are really good. Um, okay, the first one. Mm. Well, probably you could tell us many things about this uh, as well, because we've been discussing this before in Princeton, and, and I remember that we talk about this, but, but well, you asked me, so I, I will answer. But basically, I think that uh, we tend to see that uh, globalization is a unified phenomenon. Uh, somehow, that it, there's things that happen everywhere and that affect everyone. And we many times don't take into account that that's a very modern idea, and we somehow could benefit from a huge discussion that has happened since those ideas were developed, and that we could see that there's never such a thing. Basically, there's no globalization. There's a number of realities that get to be distributed within uh, transnational uh, domains or demarcations, but it doesn't mean that they affect equally to everyone or that they even participate in by everyone. So the first thing that I think is very important is to see that there's no such a thing as universal realities. And, to, and that has a huge implication in architectural practices that are very much founded on modern ideas in which we tend to think that the world is becoming one. Uh, when you see all cases that I've been talking about, this reality is very, very clear. So for instance, uh, this Murid Brotherhood is very much happening in Paris or Mad Madrid and Tuba, but it's not happening in many other places in between. So basically it's a reality that is mobilizing a huge number of entities, but not all of them. And when you see the 432 Park Avenue reality, that enactment again, it's only affecting a tiny part of society. But it's very much distributed in different parts of the world. So uh, this has a very particular demand to practices, that basically we have to go to the facts themselves, and that there's no way, for instance, to generalize in many of these realities. Uh, there's a number of people that are theorizing this. I'm not going to give the whole list. If someone wants, uh, I will be happy to, to provide it. But basically, I think that a number of people are saying that practices need to be laboratories in daily, daily life and that any assumption needs to be based on actual facts that, are, that can be accounted from very particular groups of entities, and that only, the only way to intervene them is to do by tentatives. That was something that was very important, for instance, in Europe at some time, when the political ecology uh, 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 theory emerged, and that was very influential, for instance, in the environmental public policies that brought concepts like uh, the precautionary principle that, in my opinion, was super interesting, that basically said that there was a no single criteria to intervene or to regulate uh, environmental issues, but there was a need to produce kind of a laboratorization of environments, particular environments uh, in the world, in order to be able to operate on them. So basically, what I'm saying is that uh, from the perspective that I'm working, there's no such a thing as globalization. There's uh, transnational uh, realities. And we have to deal with them by experimenting on them and seeing how our experiments uh, produce effects there. OK, the second question was about uh, official politics and how to intervene on them, because uh, as you said, they have a very direct effect on um, daily life. In my opinion, uh, I'm not so convinced about that. I mean, there's, of course, big uh, political movements that, and change of trends that have a direct effect on uh, the reality we live in. But it's also true that 
uh, what I'm interested on, let's say, uh, it's the politics that are performed by the material assemblages. And that's something slightly different. It brings the opportunity to go very much to the detail of how by putting together this water here with this light, with this uh, amount of people, uh, with this uh, programming and by recording it, we produce a very particular situation that somehow uh, make some things possible, but also make all the, peop all the possibilities not so likely. Exclude some people and include other. Uh, provide uh, awareness of certain realities, but not of others. And these sort of uh, exclusions, inclusions, permission, not permission, um, uh, relationship, dependencies, solidarities, uh, it's basically terms that we gain from the politics domains. And those are the politics I'm working on. Uh, I think those are the ones that at some point also have a huge influence on the making of daily life. And that's why I'm interested on them. Yeah, please. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I'm just uh, asking for a little bit of a clarity on the question of politics. So I'm going to give you a choice. Is A or B? <laughs> a, floating signifier of desire. Pardon? Pardon? The floating signifier of desire. I'm sort of asking from, from your talk, that's A. That's where I see, I see you talking about politics that way. Or B, the staging of fragmented uh, repressed. I see, I see two, I see others, but I mean, I see two different scenarios of the politics. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out, am I just seeing multiple or is there really one? Do you want me to repeat them? No, yeah, please, repeat them. <laughs> but, yeah. Right, they're, they're different in the consequences. Yeah, of course. Okay, I mean, that's why I'm trying to find out if yeah. there's really one, or maybe it could be two, right? So the floating signifier of desire yeah. Played through your activities, yeah. right? In which the traditional notion of politics is, is not at play, right? But a certain uh, enacting yeah, yeah. processes, right? Mm -hmm. Or, but that's sort of one way. And then the other is the staging of the fragmented repressed, where in some sense the voice of the politics is not, not in play at all, but rather it's a type of eruption of certain things that had been silenced that are brought into the visual discursive uh, domain regardless of what the consequences were, yeah. right? And so in the first, the consequences are, in some sense, what's at play. In the second one, you, you could care less what the consequences were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's either A or B. Well, I, 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 disagree. I, I mean, I think it's a very good way of putting it, and it's a very, very interesting presentation, but I, I don't think that there's a possibility of having one without having the other. They're totally interrelated, and they're dependent ones to the others. So when you see in detail how fra fragments emerge and in a common ground, for instance, you see that there's a huge uh, participation of desiring on them. From an ecological point of view, that's something very obvious. Fragments many times get together by the way they're fueled by erotism, for instance. And desire is a component of our society that is so important that when we see any of the cases that I showed, Fragments come together and they get confronted and articulated many times uh, moved by desire constructions. But the question is very interesting because it brings together many different traditions that somehow are, have been developed apart from each other. So I, I think your question is, is momentous and it's kind of nailing uh, some fundamental uh, ways of performing politics in society. But also, I would say that there's a need to bring these traditions together. And that's what I'm trying to do. Because basically, what happens most of the times is that when people work on one of them, they really fail on explaining part of the process. And when they work on the other, they automatically also fail to explain part of the things that they're dealing with. So in a way, I could suggest that probably we are in your question now. 
But there's a need to find opportunities to reconsider how we relate these traditions. But I think it's a great way, a brilliant way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had one question only. Uh, when, when we were just talking about uh, you doing thresholds, um, I was put in a very difficult position because your office has such a long name. And I emailed Andres and I said, well, um, can we just put one name? It's, can we put Andres Hake Architects or Office of Political Innovation? Uh, perhaps we can, it's very hard to fit in the space that we have. And he's like, no, it has to be both and there's a reason. Uh, and I think I, I, I suspect some of the reasons, but I'd like you to explain them a little bit as also, um, just a devailing a little bit of how um, the office, the actual sort of projects and the more experimental perhaps part of the office sort of come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, very, it's something that uh, for me it's been kind of uh, important to deal with or, and in, in the office we've been discussing this all the time, especially when we started to work uh, because there was a moment in which we saw that uh, what we wanted to be dealing with was something that most of the time was left behind by architectural practices. But then we saw that the traditions that could help us uh, work with that were part of the architectural practices. And not only the traditions, but the whole societies that could somehow be our allies on doing that. So on the one hand, we wanted to break through somehow into a different way of dealing with our work and different um, methodologies and processes. But on the other, we needed to really be connected to many things that had happened before in architecture. Even though many of those things were kind of the periphery and were very much hidden and forgotten for many, by many people. Uh, so. We, this, this sounds a little bit abstract, but it was not abstract. Basically, were basic things like uh, we wanted to have commissions, but then we wanted to deal with the commissions in a different way. Or we wanted to be constructing things and designing buildings, but we knew that we wanted to build them and construct them through very different processes. But in order to many times be entitled to do that, we needed to be presented that as, uh, uh, let's say, and actual architectural practices. But then in order to get connected to all the debates, all the disciplines, all the ideas, all the traditions, we needed to be perceived and being able to somehow imagine ourselves and uh, organize ourselves as something different. So for a time, we had two phases, two organizations, two processes, two ways of speaking that came together in many of the works but also get a part in many works that somehow we develop in one or the other part. It doesn't mean that we were doing, uh, let's say, architectural projects uh, and then other things. No, it was not like that. It was basically that some aspects of the projects, we needed to develop them in a conversation with sociologists, uh, with uh, people coming from so, uh, uh, political sciences, uh, with journalists, and we had to work in slowing down the process, for instance, and other parts of what we were doing, even in the same project, needed to be speed up, uh, guaranteed, minimizing the risk, and worked at something that could be uh, uh, um, uh, signed as an architectural project. This kind of recomposition of our practice was very important, and initially was very problematic for us. So many people would say, what you're doing is not architecture. Uh, many people would say things like, uh, mm, if you pay attention to things like interiors, it's because you don't really, you're not ambitious enough with architectural practices. Uh, if you uh, spend too much time doing interviews, 
uh, your practice is not going to be strong enough in the, uh, uh, and not competitive to other practices, if you don't explain yourself with simple ideas, uh, the, uh, there's no way that you're going to win competitions. These sort of things, it was what we were getting every day. But at the same time, we were getting other things. For instance, we could have conversations with people from other practices. We could start to see our work, how it was interesting in other contexts. We could start to see that all the traditions in architecture started to be very useful to respond to many of the questions that we were doing to ourselves. And for instance, we could see basic things like tiny uh, budgets with long times were really very good for us to experiment. Or for instance, that uh, uh, projects that other people would think that were impossible to deal with, we could find tools to really make something interesting in those contexts. So in a way for me, it was very interesting to see how it's not only important to think how you deal with a specific projects, but also how you construct the frame in which you basically work and approach projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.